Way to go, Sarah. Get limber, boss. Cool. Thank you. So Dr. John's story, um, you know, for me, I haven't met you yet. I'm Dr. Dave. Nice to meet you. Um, Dr. John's story brings to mind for me two most important questions that every single one of us has to ask at some point in our life. And those two questions, the first one is, what is the most important asset that every single one of us has to have? If we want to see our, our goals, our dreams, our desires come to pass, and absolutely, it's our health. I mean, if you ask anybody who's ever lost their health, they'd do anything to get it back, right? So his mom was dealing with the suicide pain, just excruciating pain going up and through her face. And the woman, you know, she could put up with a broken arm for, what did he say it was, six weeks? She had a hairline fracture in her arm and she was able to put up with that pain? I mean, that's pretty, pretty crazy. Pain is one uh, symptom of probably 40, plus symptoms that are the most common symptoms we see people come into our clinic with. Um, and the, the deal with it is pain itself, it being a symptom, is enough of a distraction that it stops you from being the person that God called you to be, right? Like, raise your hand if you've ever had a headache. Pretty much every one of us has had a headache. Now, if you had a headache and you had to do a presentation, how, how much less effective would you be at performing that presentation or being able to pull it off if you had a headache? I mean, it, it interferes with your thought process, it interferes with your ability to function, and so when it comes down to it, that's just one symptom. Imagine losing your health completely. Imagine having stage, stage four cancer. Imagine having terminal illness or terminal disease. It doesn't matter if I have a Maserati or a mansion or if I have the best relationships on the face of the planet and oodles of money, I can't enjoy any of those things if I don't have my health. So question number one, most important asset, it's our health. Question number two is, what is health? Second most important question you can ask because here it is, it's the most important asset that we have, but most of us, we have a really poor definition of what exactly is health to begin with. So if I were to ask you guys and we're going around the room and I would say, hey, how do you know whether or not you're healthy? What would you guys say? I'm gonna ask you lots of questions today, so just feel free to shout out answers. 
It makes it a little bit more fun. I know if I'm healthy if, boom, fill in the blank. I feel good. Cool. So if I feel good, and this is the most common answer I, I usually hear, how I feel. Um, there you go. How I look, exercising, eating right, being fit, all very important standards when it comes to whether or not I'm healthy, and they're all necessary for me to facilitate health. The problem is they're not a working definition. Let's start with the first one. It's like how I feel, right? So if I look at the top three causes of death in America right now in terms of disease, what are the diseases most Americans are suffering from? It's going to prove the point that how I feel is probably the worst way to judge my health. Third thing, second thing, first thing I heard heart disease. Heart disease is actually number one, uh, number three, I'm sorry. So last year, 656,000 Americans died because of heart disease. Now, is it possible for me to have arteries clogging and not feel it? Yeah. Possible to have high blood pressure and not feel it? 80% of us as guys, if we have heart disease, our first major sign of heart disease is our first heart attack. It's too late to find out at that point that I've got the disease developing. And for a majority of the life of the disease, I probably feel fine. Second leading cause of death in our country right now is the big C, cancer. So 784,000 Americans last year from cancer. Um, when, I was, when I was growing up, my mom was never really the sick woman. Um, she never really had any major issues going on. She felt pretty good. And then kind of out of nowhere, she just started having abdominal pain, tough time after she would eat food, digesting the food. Her whole stomach would ache. Um, and it persisted for about four to six weeks. And I remember basically what we did is we modified lifestyle. We had her exercise a little bit more. We changed up her diet. And it still persisted. So we sent her in for an MRI. MRI showed right here on the neck of the gallbladder, stage four tumor. Right there, inoperable location. Um, it was stage four cancer. And she didn't feel it until just about four to six weeks before it was considered terminal at that point. And what was crazy about it is I asked the doctor, the oncologist, well, how long has this thing been there? Um, just give it to me straight type of a thing. And he said, it's about 32 doublings. It had to have been growing for seven to nine years before it even became big enough to show up on the scan in the first place. So while that disease was developing, she didn't feel it. And the truth is, a lot of us in here, we could all have a stage four tumor in the body and not feel it right now, because what does cancer feel like? Most of the times, we don't feel it. Now, the number one cause of death in our country right now isn't actually a disease. So last year, they were saying more than heart disease, more than cancer, 1.1 million Americans last year are dying because of the philosophy of waiting until I feel, right? Because here, both of these diseases, I typically don't feel them. 82% of Americans right now, five and six Americans are getting diagnosed with heart disease or cancer. So if I don't feel it, it could be developing the entire time, which is part of the reason why this is second and third leading cause of death. But if I wait until I do feel it, then I've been trained from a young age in our country every, I don't know, geez, two, every two out of 10 commercials, if not more than that, are a commercial for what? On television. Some kind of medication. And so we're taught from a young age, when you feel it, the best way to treat the symptom is to go take a medication for it. And that philosophy of waiting and then just treating the symptom instead of being proactive and actually building health to begin with so I'm not dealing with the symptom, that's the problem. That philosophy is actually causing more death than both heart disease and cancer in our country right now. And what that is is it's called the medical model. So the breakdown of this is prescriptions given at the right time for the right reason, prescriptions given for the wrong time for the wrong reason, reactions to anesthetics, infections caught in the hospital, surgery done on the wrong side, and I can go on and on and on. But when you add all that together, plus over-the-counter medications, right? So how many of us take Tylenol, aspirin, ibuprofen? So Tylenol is the leading cause of acute kidney failure in our country today. Aspirin, baby bear aspirin. They told my grandfather to take a baby bear aspirin every single day for a healthy heart. It's an NSAID. NSAIDs last year caused 16,500 deaths. So I don't get anything out of telling you guys this other than hopefully shake you, rattle you, wake you up a little bit and say, look, this is currently what's going on. Where do I fit in this process? Um, and where I fit in this process is I might not have the best definition of health. So all these things are important, but how I feel is probably the worst way to judge my health. How I look 
exercising, eating, being fit, all very, very important, but not a working definition. So if I were to look at the World Health Organization's website, right, it says health isn't the absence of symptoms. So the symptoms that you guys may have come in with, headaches, numbness and tangling, digestive problems, low back pain, a bulging disc, whatever it might be, hormone imbalance. If you woke up tomorrow morning and boom, magically all those symptoms were gone, that would be awesome, like high five to that, right? But it wouldn't necessarily mean you're healthy. They said health is when you have optimum function, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So what's the key word there? By definition, health has everything to do with function. How well is my body working? So the cars you guys drove here today, right? If your car engine is functioning at 100%, there's no mechanical defects with your car whatsoever, I would not expect that I'm gonna find you broken down on the side of the road. It would be fairly reliable of getting you from point A to point B. Similarly, if my body is functioning at 100%, at my full God-given potential, Let's say my heart, it's beating at 100%. I'm not going to expect that my heart's just going to have a heart attack. If my heart's beating at 100%, is my heart healthy or sick? Healthy. I would say so. So if we're to look at health then from a viewpoint of function, how well things are working, and we were to scale this on a scale of function, over here on the left-hand side, 0% function, I am what? Nothing's yeah. working in my body, right? And then over here, 100% function, this is what all of us are shooting towards as our goal. This is honestly what health is. Let's skip the L in there. First four letters, my body's healing at its full God-given potential. Where most of us have wait until we get is right about here, and this is what all the research indicates, is it's not until I get to nine, it's not when I'm at 90% function, 80%, 70%, but they found 60% is when my first major symptom appears. And so what we've been trained to do is wait until I feel the symptom. And most modern medicine is designed around the symptom. Does that make sense? Like if I'm in here and I'm functioning at 80%, I have no major symptoms my body's presenting with and I go to the doctor, what do I get treated? There's nothing to treat. I mean, there's no symptom. So it's like I can't even enter the system per se. But if I get down here at 60% and the check engine light pops on, that's essentially what a symptom is. It's a built-in check engine light is our body trying to tell us, boom, alarm, you've got a problem going on, got to check under the hood. The first thing we should do if a check engine light pops on is we should take our car, plug in the little computer and figure out, well, what's the error code? What's wrong with the system? And then it tells us where to look. Instead, pull out black tape, cover up the check engine light, just keep on driving, none of us would ever do that. Like, we're smarter than that. <laughs> or there was a brake light that used to be on in one of the first cars I had, actually broke the dash and pulled the bulb out because it just I couldn't get the brake light to turn off. But if, if medication doesn't work and then another medication doesn't work, eventually down the line, I might get sent in for a special procedure to figure out what other medication do I get or what surgery do I need. It's like the organ's not working, just cut it out. Now, uh, there's a right time and a right place for medication surgery for our medical system, but it's not for building health. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Like, if my blood pressure shoots up to 300 and I don't lower my blood pressure, what happens to me? I'm dead. So I'm not gonna run in my chiropractor's office and be like, adjust my neck, doc, get my blood pressure lower, save my life. I'm gonna go to the hospital, in an emergency or a crisis, I'm gonna get on a medication, lower my blood pressure, save my life in a crisis. That's what it's there for. We have the best system in the world, some of the smartest doctors, quickest response time. So I would save my life with the medication. The problem is when do I stop taking that med? Most of the time I'm not told to come off of it. I don't know about you guys, but I don't believe that my body is once it, ha once it has a malfunction, right, and it's exhibiting a symptom, I don't believe that it's purely genetic. I don't believe that I was born that way. I don't believe that God created me broken, diseased, and damaged. But I do believe that my body has the propensity to heal from the inside out, and there surely must be an underlying what? Cause. cause. And if I can address the cause, then what happens to the symptom? Cause. Right, because the symptom is the effect. And so if I get on the medication, I lower my blood pressure, over the next four to six weeks, it would behoove me to then figure out what caused it to go high in the first place, address the cause so that I can come off of the medication. The problem is that's not the approach right now. 
And so 71% of females over the age of 30 are on three lifetime prescription medications. Just take it for the rest of your life. So this is where I come in and I say, look, there's something causing this symptom, the neck pain, the headaches, the numbness and tingling that you came in with. Let's figure out the cause and drive the function of your body in this direction closer towards 100%. And that's our approach. Make sense? Now, here's my question for you guys. Who pays for this portion of care from when the symptom appears in this direction? You. Well, if I have health insurance, that's when health insurance kicks in. So the way insurance is designed is the insurance kicks in. I'm paying the premium, I'm paying the premium, I'm paying the premium, just in case I have the emergency and then the symptom appears and I go to the doctor, prescription medication, surgery, emergency services, that's when it starts paying. But if I'm in here and I'm at 80% function, does my insurance pay for me to get healthy? No. Who does? Who's responsible for your health? You. So your health insurance is no guarantee that you're gonna be healthy, nor is it a guarantee that you know, you're, you're actually gonna save money per se. Um, the health insurance is there for when you get here and you have the emergency, you have the crisis at least most health insurance. So my health insurance isn't gonna pay for my bottled water, clean organic food, my gym membership, things that are actually gonna help me get healthy. Um, it's gonna pay when I'm down at that portion right there. So here's the question. If I'm, my main goal is, here you go, patient comes into the office, they've got a headache that they've been dealing with, on and off headaches, it's been going on for six years. They've taken six different medications for it. They've been to four different doctors. What do I wanna do? I wanna figure out what's causing the headache and if it's a neurological problem, help them take care of it. So what I really care about though is not the headache, what I care about as the doctor is getting you healthy, right? So in the process of moving your body in this direction, the symptom will go away, your body will start to heal. My concern isn't the pain, I can help you get out of the pain, we're really good at that. My concern is how healthy can we get your body? Does that make sense? So if my main concern is health, and health has everything to do with function, how well things are working in my body, where do you think the first place I should look is? Health has everything to do with function, then I need to look at the organ in my body that controls every single function. Right. Yeah, the nervous system, the brain. And so that's the first place that I'm gonna look because at the end of the day, we have a specialist for every single one of these organs in our body. I have a cardiologist I can go to that's gonna look at my heart, but if I don't look at what controls the heart first, I could miss an underlying issue that had been there for a very, very long period of time. Here's what I mean by this. God put 80 to 120 years of life right there in your brain. That life flows from your brain down your spinal cord, out the nerves to every single organ, every cell, every tissue of your body. It's what beats your heart, it breathes your lungs, it lets you wiggle your fingers, understand what I'm saying to you. For you to go to sleep last night, not think about the fact that you're sleeping, and then you woke up this morning and you breathe the entire time you're sleeping, does anybody else think that's incredible? Like there is a, a beautiful design to our body. There's an inborn intelligence that coordinates every single system. And that intelligence, that life comes from the brain. So that's the first system I'm concerned with and the reason why is because when I was developing in the womb, I actually started as a brain, then stemming off my brain was a spinal cord, branching off the spinal cord were nerves. And 18 days in the womb, I had a fully functioning nervous system. Four days later is when I had my first heartbeat. I had to have nerves over here and a nervous system before organs because everything over here controls everything over here. So is that my opinion or is that fact that our brain controls everything in our body? It's a fact, right? Like any doctor knows this. Like I'm not smarter than anybody. If I were to go to Vanderbilt University, St. Thomas Hospital, walk up to any random doctor and say, Doc, what's the most important system in your body? What's he gonna say? Brain and central nervous system. And I go up to another one, brain and central nervous system, go up to another. I'd go to 100 of them and they all should say that answer because it's the first thing we learn in school. Elementary kids know this. Here's my beef with it. It's the most important system in my body when it comes to my health, but chances are nobody's ever looked at it for your health. Because raise your hand if before you guys met me, before you came into this clinic, before I met you on Facebook or came, came to your workplace, if any doctor has ever checked to see how well is my brain telling the organs in my body how to function, heal, and work. 
So that's my beef with it, and that's why I get, why I get so jazzed up about this. Because let's say, God forbid, I get into a car accident, right? We can agree that, first of all, my brain tells my heart how to beat, right? So I don't have to sit there and be like, beat, 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 beat. It just does it because of that beautiful design. My brain sends life through that wire to my heart to tell the heart how to beat. Now, if I were to get in a car accident and damage this nerve right here, and the very, very best that this nerve could ever work is 80%, what's the very best I'd ever expect my heart's going to beat? Like, it would be physically impossible. I'm not going to expect it's going to beat at 100% if the nerves are damaged going to it. So if I were to come along then, and the severe example here is I take a pair of scissors, or Edward Scissorhands comes along, and he cuts that nerve completely in half going to your heart. What happens to your heart? Boom, your heart stops, you're dead. Now, if instead of cutting the nerve, I come along less severe, and I squeeze and pinch that nerve going to my heart, is my heart going to get healthier or sicker? And so if I leave it and I pinch it for a month, six months, maybe longer, a year, five years, 10 years, eventually that heart begins to malfunction, develop disease, it produces symptoms. What would a symptom of a sick heart be? Uh, palpitations. Yeah, potentially. Or my heart's a muscle, it has to beat harder. So what's that do to my blood pressure? Oh, Shoots my blood pressure up. Now, if I work out a muscle and I keep working it out, working it out, working it out, what happens to the muscle? It gets bigger. That's actually called congestive heart failure. The two bottom ventricles of my heart enlarge, 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 and then the heart eventually shuts down. So here's the deal with this. If I were squeezing the nerves and the nerve was damaged and that's what was causing the symptom of high blood pressure, I could take a medication. And as long as I'm on the medication to lower the blood pressure, how, low is my, or how long is my blood pressure low? as long as I'm on the medication. But when I stop taking it, what happens? So I can exercise all day long, eat all the kale on the face of the planet, take every medication. Um, I can do all of those things, but until I address the underlying damage, how long is my blood pressure high? Exactly. So the point I'm trying to make here is in terms of hierarchy, the very first place I have to look for my health is always going to be the nervous system. Because if I don't check here first, I could have issues for years and years and years of my life with the organ and how the organ is performing. Because if damage on a nerve has the propensity, I, I look at it just as seriously as heart disease or cancer because if I know if I were to damage a nerve and I leave it, it can cause the organ it goes to to malfunction, develop disease, produce symptoms, and even shut down early. And we all know this to be true when it comes to blood flow, right? So if my kidneys, I were to block blood going to my kidneys by 60%, 80% blocked blood, what happens to my kidney? I have kidney failure. So it's the same thing here, except instead of talking about blood flow, we're talking about electrical impulse, life flowing through my nervous system through the wires. So could I have a problem with the heart itself? Absolutely. This is why we need specialists like a cardiologist. I could have a heart valve defect, and it's a problem right there at the heart, and it has nothing to do with the nerve. Do you get what I'm saying? But if there's a problem with the nerve and all I'm doing is looking at the heart, I could miss it. So in terms of hierarchy, if I look at the nervous system first, it's the best course of action. So that's what I did with you guys. We went ahead and we checked this system immediately. We ran a scan, a computerized nerve scan, from your tailbone up to the base of the neck. That scan is going to tell us where is there imbalance in the system. Because we can't rely solely on the pain. I have people that come in, they're like, Doc, this is where the pain is, right here. And I'm like, I get, I get that you have low back pain. I get the sciatica is there. But where do I have to look first? I have to look at everything. Because right up here in your neck are the same nerves that come out of your low back. They physically have to travel through your neck first before they ever come out down there. God didn't make us wireless. We're wired. So everything has to be considered at that point. And not, on, not only that, but if I were to look at all my nerves, 58 million nerves in my entire spine, out of 58 million nerves, only 7% sense pain. Just 7%. So that means the other 93% is just telling an organ how to work, telling my stomach how to digest food, telling my pancreas how to make insulin, right? So a lot of times I can have damage there, and it's affecting part of the nerve that I don't feel. And so that's why it's important that we do objective testing like a scan. Now, the scan, it'll tell us what levels of the spine there's issues taking place. Potentially, there could be damage on those nerves. And then it 
our job from there is to figure out what's causing the damage. And that's where we go with this, this guy right here, the spine. So this is the rationale for taking x-rays. If I run a scan and the scan says, you've got trouble right here in the middle part of the neck, then I have to figure out, well, what's causing the trouble? So what I need to do is look at what protects this system in my body. So this system is the only system that's wrapped in hard bone, okay? So the bone has to have a very specific alignment in order for it to do its job protecting each of these nerves. Make sense? So from a front view, my spine has to be totally straight. If it looks like this, it's nice and straight from the front, the bones are lined up properly. From a side view, what I'm looking for is healthy is a forward curve in my low back, backward curve in my mid spine, and then a forward curve in my neck. So if I have three curves from the side, and then my spine is nice and straight from the front, and I'm dealing with headaches or pain or a symptom, it's not a nerve problem. Because when the bones are lined up properly, they're gonna protect each of those nerves. What happens is the bones move out of alignment. We shift the spine. This is called subluxation. And this is the diagnosis we're looking for. The dichotomy is instead of protecting the nerve, when I start shifting the bones, it now starts to damage the nerve. So the very opening where, there you go, nice and healthy nerve right there by my finger, I come and shift the bone, it starts to pinch the nerve. That's called subluxation. So I'm damaging the nerve, and where that nerve goes then could produce symptoms. And so that's what this chart is showing you is different levels of the spine. It's the same underlying principle that we're looking for, damaged nerves. If I damage a nerve going to my digestive system, what does malfunction in my digestive system look like? Could be upset stomach, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea. What if I upset nerves in the top part of my neck that affect blood flow up and around to my forehead? What could I have? Headache. Could have a headache. And if I have an intense headache and I leave it for a longer period of time, it starts affecting my vision. I get an aura and light hurts. It makes it worse. It's called a migraine, right? And I have to wall myself off in a dark room. And then intense noises, loud noises will intensify my headache, right? It's all the same part of the nervous system with the eyes and the ears right there in the top part of the neck. And so it's just the same underlying principle, damage on a nerve can produce a completely different symptom depending on where the nerve goes. Make sense? All right. So when it comes down to it, what we're looking for is very simply from the front and back view, our spine has to be nice and straight. From the side view, we're looking for curves. And this picture doesn't do it justice. We're looking for more accentuated curves, which I'll show you in just a second. The question though I always get when I show you your x-rays, and people's spine is all jacked up, right? And instead of me having this nice healthy curve in my neck, it looks like that. People are always like, how did it get there? I don't get it. How did that happen? And the simple answer is life. So however many years you've been living in your body, so me, I'm like, okay, 31 years now that I've been using my spine every single day, looking left and right, moving up and down. I'm carrying around a 14 pound bowling ball head, right? And when I was younger, my mom put this 50 pound backpack on me and sent me off to school like this with forward head posture and colliding on the football field and getting into car accidents and then driving, leaning to the side and sleeping like a pretzel. And you just, the cumulative effect of gravity weighing down on your spine you can very easily move a bone. Here's where it most, of, most of us starts though. We're not born with all the curves in our spine. When we're born and we're a baby and we come out, we have one curve, middle part of the back. The other curves, our neck and our low back, we develop as we age. And so when a kid starts, or a baby starts crawling, what do we do? We pick our head up and so we develop our neck curve. And then when kids start learning how to walk, we fall 5,000 times by the age of five learning how to walk, but we develop our low back curve. So most of us have neck and low back issues with our spine, neck pain, low back pain, neck bulging disc, low back bulging disc, numbness and tingling and carpal tunnel and thyroid imbalance and sciatica. And the question is, why is it always neck and low back? Very simple, two reasons. Number one, when I was younger, I never developed this curve properly. And then it just stuck with me over the course of my life. Number two is I developed it properly, the, but then mom never came along and taught me how to brush my teeth with my spine. You get what I'm saying? Like I wasn't taught preventative care and maintenance so that I'm maintaining the curve. And over the years, if I went 14, 18, 22 years without brushing my teeth, I get cavities. You go 14, 18, 20 years without taking care of your spine, gravity 
pulls it all out of alignment. Make sense? Okay. So when it comes down to it, most important area we have to look first, most important area in our spine is not our low back, it's gonna be our neck. So when you put up your x-rays, you wanna make sure you take notes for this section, because I'm gonna be asking you, or Dr. John's gonna be asking you, do you see some of these things that we're looking for as normal? So a little anatomy 101, this is your head. And these are the bones in your neck. Each of the bones in your neck should be relatively the same shape, nice and square. And between the bones, you've got spacing. Those spaces are called discs. Those discs are 88% water. They act as shock absorbers. They let you move bone on top of bone. So the first thing we're looking for is going to be called your arc of life. Very simply, arc of life. We're looking for a nice, healthy curve. So if I were to put a line on the back of each of the bones, and then I connect those lines, it should be a nice, smooth, continuous arc. Now the arc is the strongest structure known to man, the Natchez Trace Bridge, the Roman aqueducts, the Hoover Dam from an aerial view, the St. Louis Arcway, all 43 degree arcs. Very sound structure. We need to have a 43 degree arc because we carry around a lot of weight with our head. So this is gonna equally distribute the weight and it's a nice sound structure. So I'll keep things as simple as I can for you guys and just say, look, we did bone studies. Healthy curve in my neck, I would have to apply so much force from gravity pushing down that I would fracture and break bones before the discs in between those bones ever herniate. So herniated bulging disc, almost impossible if I have the proper structure. Now if I lose the structure and my neck looks like that and I start applying force, what happens? It does not look very healthy at all. So it's an unsound structure. So if I'm having herniated disc, bulging disc, I have to look at the structure and say, why is it taking place? Second thing we're looking for is gonna be, here you go. You've got bone, bone, bone going all the way up. All these bones are relatively the same shape and size. And then I get up top here and I've got this other weird looking bone. What's the deal with that guy? That bone is the most important bone in your entire spine. It's called Atlas. Right here in the top part of the neck, it's the first bone in your neck. Atlas was a Greek god. He had to hold the world on his shoulders. This holds our world up. This bone looks like this. From above, it's a big signet ring. This is the bone that lets you turn your head side to side. You can feel it right here behind your ears in a soft spot, and there's a little notch right there. That's the side of the bone. So this is life size. Um, it's plastic, it's not a real bone. I'll pass that around to just show you guys what that looks like. Every single nerve that comes from my brain supplying life down into my body flows through that bone. 58 million nerves. So it's very, very important that this bone is sitting at the right angle. Second thing we're looking for is that atlas is at an 18 degree angle. So from a side view, it looks like an airplane taking off. If my atlas is at 18 degrees, I'm good. I'm nice and healthy. If not, and it doesn't look like an airplane taking off, it looks like a rocket sh or a airplane landing, nice and flat like this, I'm in trouble. That means pressure on what that bone protects, my brainstem. If instead it looks like a rocket ship shooting up, too high, I'm in trouble, pressure on my brainstem. So what is our brainstem control? Everything. Yeah, it's not a trick question. It controls everything you're, you don't have to think about. Mood, hormone levels, tension and focus, it controls blood pressure, it controls breathing, controls my circadian rhythm, my sleep cycle, it controls digestion, my pancreas and insulin levels. What disease is that? Yeah. Diabetes. Pancreas. Diabetes, yeah. 105 million Americans, diabetic or pre-diabetic, I guarantee you very few of them have ever had that nerve checked coming from the top part of the neck. And so the crazy part about this is that one nerve coming off my brainstem goes to nine different organs. And if I were to come to the root of that nerve and pinch it right at the root, what could it affect? It doesn't have to, but yeah, it could absolutely affect every single one of those organs. It just depends on the person. The third thing we're looking for is spacing. So big, fat, plump, discs, so we want equal sizing on each of those discs going up. Cool? What flows through at the same level as the disc is gonna be my nerve in between those bones. So if the disc is nice and thick and there's good spacing, the opening for the nerve is gonna be good, but if I compress the bones together and squeeze that disc, what happens is it closes off the nerve opening and starts squeezing and compressing the nerve. The most important area we have spacing is gonna be right up top here at the top part of the neck above 
I can't hold it like that, above and below um, the atlas band. And I actually have a neck model that I left all the way over there, but I could show you guys that um, right here on the x-ray. You're looking for big space above and below the atlas. If I don't have spacing there and these bones are jammed together like that and there's no spacing, it's compressing the brain stem and the part of the nervous system that flows through there. So three things from the side. Arc of life has to measure 43 degrees. Number two, atlas or airplane has to be taking off at 18 degrees. And then big, fat, plump discs and spacing above and below the atlas. Cool? Any questions on that? No? All right, moving on. So when I put up your x-rays, I'm going to tell you you're normal. Phase one, phase two, or phase three degeneration. And all this means is how long has the problem been there? Because it's not an overnight process for me to like wake up tomorrow morning and then boom, I just like lose my curve today. So this process of going from normal through the phases of degeneration, I'll show you a time lapse video of how this happens over the course of someone's lifetime. But very simply, it takes a long time for me to lose proper structure. So for me to go from a normal curve in my neck to my neck is now straight and I've lost all the curvature is 12 to 15 years of muscle memory, gravity, postural habits, gravity just weighing down on my spine. Does that make sense? So to go from normal, now it's not just straight, but it's actually starting to teeter and curve in the wrong direction. It's called a reverse curve. Phase two degeneration is about 15 to 22 years of degeneration. And then to go from normal to phase three, I don't see a lot of people make it through our doors as phase three. I've been practicing for five years. I've seen three people at phase three. The worst of them was a woman that came in on a walker, multiple surgeries, three different types of cancer that she had. And she brought in um, her new patient paperwork. It said, list medications you're taking. And she said, see attached. And the attached list was 37 prescription medications. There wasn't a lot we can do when the spine degenerates so much that it naturally fuses bones together. So how long the problem has been there is gonna determine how much work do we actually have to do with chiropractic adjustments, working the muscles, retraining the muscles, um, and physical therapy to get the spine back to where it needs to be. So very simply, this person is much better off than this person, fair? So which one of these two requires more work to get back to normal? Phase two. So as long as you understand that, I think uh, the rest of it, we could go in through details all day long. This is the important part down here. Um, so I'll tell you about that. When I was younger, I had a really bad, uh, really bad allergic reaction, triggered an asthma attack, right? And so my airways start closing up. Mom rushes me off to the hospital, three years old when this happens. They get me to the hospital, they EpiPen me, they get the allergic reaction to stop, they get the breathing under control, then they send me out to a specialist as a follow-up. I go to the specialist, they test me, and they're like, this kid's allergic to everything. Cat hair, dog hair, fresh cut uh, grass, tree leaves, my own dead skin, dust, right? And so I may as well have been the boy in the bubble, but I had these like really severe allergic reactions. My skin would get hives on them, my eyes would puff up and kind of welt around the eye and almost close. And then they put me on two different allergy medications, um, a nasal spray, and then for my asthma, two different asthma inhalers. So I was on five prescriptions from the age of three going all the way up till about 18. So I was not by any account necessarily a healthy kid. Um, and when I was growing up, I used to look up to my grandfather as being the epitome of health, right? So like here's grandpa, exercises all the time, takes care of himself, he's eating really well, he's vegetarian. Um, 31 years in a row, he goes, gets the blood pressure cuff on the arm, looks up the nose, down the throat, checks his vital signs, and they give him a clean bill of health. They're like, you're good to go, here you go, you can drive the truck, you pass your physical. So 31 years in a row, he does that, and then boom, out of nowhere, my dad gets a phone call, my grandfather's walking out of the gym in the Bronx, New York, right after working out, and he dropped right there on the street. He had a heart attack, his heart shut down. I never got to say goodbye to my grandfather, and for me, that was something that always stuck with me because I didn't get it. Like, I thought he did what he was supposed to do to be healthy. He exercised, and he ate really well, and he took care of himself, and he got his physicals. So what happened? When I saw this research for the first time, it blew my mind. What this is right here is the difference between this guy and this guy. I don't take x-rays because I care about bones. I don't care what the, about what your bones look like per se. What I care about is what those bones are protecting. 
What's flowing through those bones? So if we were to look from above, this is MRI cross-sectional research that shows what's inside there, my spinal cord. With a normal healthy curve in the neck, I want you guys to feel this. Put your hand up for me, put a curve in your hand. This is your neck, nice healthy curve. Feel your skin, that's your spinal cord. Lose your curve. What happened to the skin? The MRI research showed exactly that. Right here, normal healthy curve in the neck, the spinal cord inside, when I'm looking at it from above, this is strong healthy bone, small space, big spinal cord. They found 12 to 15 years later, the spinal cord inside there gets stretched, tethered like a rubber band. It weakens the bone density around big space, tiny spinal cord. That means 30% less life coming from my brain going to every organ in my body. And the crazy part about this is you don't feel it. So the part of your spinal cord that stretches, there are nerve paths that aren't pain sensing nerves. So I could go my entire life without feeling this going on. And I guarantee you that's what happened to my grandfather. I have no proof of it. I don't have his x-rays to show you, but I know for sure he had never gone to a chiropractor a day in his life and he had never had his nervous system checked. But he had gone for years and years and years of physicals, and they told him he was healthy. And then we've got this guy in our body, I mean in our uh, family, like Uncle Billy, right? So like, how's Uncle Billy still alive? He never exercises, smokes all the time, drinks, sits on the couch, and he's outliving grandpa. Like, how's that possible? He's now 65, and he trashes his body and doesn't take care of it. Well, boom, we take x-rays on Uncle Billy, He's pretty close to this. He's about a 38 degree curve in his neck, healthy nervous system. So boom, he can put up with it. It's like George Burns over here, right? So the first place we always have to look is gonna be the nervous system. And that's why the x-rays are so important. So this principle right here is the process of what's called subluxation. So that's the only diagnosis I care about. If you write down one word today, make it this word right up here, subluxation. Sub means less than. Lux means divine light. Asian is a condition of. So subluxation is anything physically with my spine that interferes with the nervous system. It could be a bulging herniated disc pushing onto a nerve. It could be me losing the structure, the curve in my neck, stretching the spinal cord. It could be direct pinched nerve. But what it does is it is a condition of less than 100% life flowing through that nerve. So that's the diagnosis we're looking for. So do you guys remember what happened to Superman? Christopher Reeves? So the actor that played Superman, he was riding along on his horse. He had a horsing accident and he fell off his horse and he jutted his chin into the ground. That top bone in his neck when that happened pushed forward and it went right into the brainstem. It's the only bone that he broke and when that happened it was like instantaneous. He was quadriplegic from the neck down. He lost all control. He had to have a, a machine uh, attached, well, a bunch of machines attached to a wheelchair that would roll him around. He damaged one bone in the neck. He had to have pacemaker beat his heart for him because it wouldn't beat on its own. He damaged one bone in the neck. He had iron lungs pumping and breathing his lungs for him. Just that bone in the neck, he even had a team of specialists that would like push on his colon so he could go to the bathroom in a colostomy bag. Christopher Reeves did not have bad organs. It's not like someone came and stabbed his heart and his heart stopped working. That's not where the damage was. Christopher Reeves had a bad nervous system. So when I measure your x-rays and we're looking at your atlas bone in the top part of the neck, I'm not measuring it in a quarter of an inch, the width of your pinky, because that's all it took for Christopher Reeves. I'm not even gonna measure it in millimeters because if a quarter of an inch is enough, it shuts it all off like that. A couple of millimeters does the same thing, in my opinion, just over a longer period of time. We're gonna measure it in degrees. If there's even one degree that that bones out, I'm gonna let you know. Because I know it's the most important system in your body. From a back view, healthy spine, on your x-rays what you're gonna see is red lines. Red lines are where the center of each of the bones are. And those red lines need to match up with the center black line. So this guy right here is an example of a very, very healthy nervous system. The hips are nice and level. And then the spine going all the way up is nice and straight. That's what we're looking for. So this is a third generation chiropractor. He's lucky he was adjusted from birth. If my spine looks like that, healthy or sick. Yep. So if my spine looks like that, it's definitely not healthy. That is considered 
sick. It's called scoliosis. If you ask any, uh, any doctor, neurologist, orthopedic doctor, pediatrician, is scoliosis bad? They're going to tell you yes, because they would never do a major scoliosis surgery, a $250,000 spinal surgery, if it wasn't serious. And what they want to do is when the scoliosis gets severe enough, they lay down on table, cut open, bolt into the bones, metal rods, and try and straighten the spine out. Because major scoliosis will cause cardiopulmonary failure. It causes the heart and lungs to shut down. So if this is severe, life-threatening, and not healthy, is this healthy or sick? Sick. Is this healthy or sick? There's still curve in the spine, so I'm concerned about it. I want to get it out of there. It might not be where the symptoms are at yet, but it's certainly affecting function. You guys get where I'm going with this? Um, so when you see the, the curve in the spine like this, oh, other way, when you see the curve in the spine, if the spine was in fact doing that, on the inside of the curve, all the nerves are getting pinched. On the outside of the nerve or the spine, all the nerves are getting stretched. So it affects both levels. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of different x-rays. The first x-ray I'm going to show you, we'll skip over her story just to save you guys a little bit of time. The first x-ray I'm going to show you is a girl that 41 years of age, right? Um, I don't have to tell you her story, but we can start with her. This little seven-year-old girl, this is an x-ray. She's had bedwetting, constipation, and allergies. She's had three medications. She's been to multiple different doctors. Nobody's ever looked at her nervous system, so I took x-rays with her. When I took the x-rays, her hips were nice and level. That wasn't an issue, but the red line is where her spine is at. The black is where it should be. Where do you guys see an issue? Looks fine? Oh. oh, okay. I was like, all right. Um, so red line, where it's at right here, curves all to the right. Right here between these two lines, if you see a marking like this on your x-ray, it's showing you that's what the spine is doing between those lines. So she has a seven degree curve. Her spine, seven degree scoliosis, turns out that she had damage and compression on the nerves that are coming out in between each of those bones, going right to her large intestine and back towards the bladder, both of which were areas where she was having trouble. Mom didn't want to get her adjusted though because she couldn't believe it was that simple. Um, so she wanted to go get a second opinion. She took the girl to an orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeon looked at the x-rays and said, no, she's fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It's not even severe enough to diagnose it for scoliosis. In the insurance world, it has to be 15 degrees before I even diagnose it as scoliosis and bill for it. So he said, just wait six months, make sure it doesn't get any worse, we'll take new x-rays. So if I wait six months and I do nothing about this, which is a problem, what happens to my problem? And that's exactly what happened to her. Um, this is when I was a student intern. I passed all of my uh, patients to the next upcoming student intern underneath me um, and then headed here to Nashville to practice. And when I was here in Nashville, he called me up and he's like, hey, Dave, you're never going to believe it. Little Madison, mom brought her back in. We took new x-rays. I was like, let me guess, her spine got worse. It went from 7 to 16 degrees in six months. So um, that's kind of how it starts. Then if my spine continues to develop and curves a whole lot in the low back, I'm not going to walk around like this. What do I do without thinking about it? My body tries to correct it so it'll counterbalance and put a second curve in the spine. The next girl's x-rays I'm going to show you. She's 41 years old. I'm practicing here in Nashville. Her name's Jessica. Jessica comes in. She's been dealing with migraine headaches for the past 16 years, 16 years of migraines, doing Imitrex injections in the arm to deal with the pain. Um, she's had it going so long now with the same condition. She actually got dropped from insurance, so she spends $320 a month out of pocket for the medication. Um, her big issue, though, is her and her husband have been trying to get pregnant, so they just want to start a family. She's 41. She knows she's running out of time. She's like kind of desperate at this point, but she's had four miscarriages. Um, this is after already going through fertility treatment, fertility clinic options. They've spent $22,000 on fertility options. And then on top of all this, she's grown up with scoliosis her entire life and has never been to a chiropractor. She's like, can you help me? I'm like, oh my God, I mean, I don't know. The, you guys will ask me if you end up becoming a patient, hey, can you help my friend with this and that? And I'll be like, I don't know, let's take what? X-rays, because I mean, I'm not gonna guess. We might as well take x-rays and see what's going on first. And so from the back view, this is Jessica, her left hip, right hip, 35 degree scoliosis in her low back bending towards the side. 
What's happening to the nerves that are coming out here? Those nerves are getting crushed. 25 plus years of degeneration on the nerves going right to the reproductive organs. And I said, Jessica, no wonder why you can't get pregnant. You've had 25 years of life getting cut off to the organs. As you go up further in the spine though, this top half of the spine, here's her neck and shoulders. What is that? Yeah, metal turns out bright white on x-rays and it turns out for her, 1997, she went in for scoliosis surgery. They wanted to put metal rods in her spine because she had a 35 degree curve bending to the side. So they scheduled her, they did the surgery. The surgery cost $244,000. And she was like, well, my insurance paid for a majority of it. It was really good coverage. I said, how much did they pay? She said 90%. So they covered 90%. She was left over with 10% of that bill, $24,000 to put a metal rod in the spine. And it didn't even fix the problem. After the surgery, they considered it successful. It took it down to an 11 degree curve. And then over time, because they never addressed the underlying issue, which happened to be tension in the neck on the spinal cord, her spine still curved 42 degrees underneath that metal rod. There is nothing I can do about that. It's not like my teeth rot, fall out, and I get dentures and fake teeth put in. I can't do that with my spine. But with that, in the low back, we can definitely work with that and help her start to correct the issue. So how do we go about correcting the low back? How do we correct the spine? Three ways. And you guys that got adjusted, you experienced some of this. So First step is I have to warm the spine up. Um, I could easily adjust a cold spine and get mo uh, movement and motion and hear a poppy noise, but it's not gonna be an, an exact adjustment and, or as thorough as what we need. So the first step is we have to warm the tissue up. If I wanna mold cold candle wax, it is not gonna be nearly as successful as if I heat the candle wax up. So the same thing happens for your body. We wanna warm the tissue up. We do that with cervical traction on the wall over here and the red wobble cushions you guys were sitting on doing those exercises, all that's designed to do is actually warm the tissue up, bring blood to the muscles, stretch out the tendons and ligaments, but most importantly, it pumps these things called your discs in between the bones. Now your intervertebral discs, they dehydrate over time. When you turn 24, you lose blood supply to the disc and it starts to degenerate without proper motion. So the only way to keep the discs healthy is through proper motion. It, it does this thing called imbibition. It forces water and nutrients in. So when we do the warm-up exercises, we're warming the tissue up, but we're also stopping degeneration. Then all the tissue is nice and warm. Step number two is I have to come by and adjust. So if I was taking care of the neck, and that's my neck, I lost my curve, I warm the tissue up, I adjust the bones, we put the bones back in the right position, it takes pressure off the nervous system. Awesome. Chiropractic for the past 117 years has been exactly that. Awesome, I adjust you, you feel better, your body heals. The problem is when you leave, what happens? You go back to where Muscle memory pulls everything back to where your body's used to having it. And so you don't hold the adjustment. So step number three is we have to rehabilitate or rehab the muscles. So how do we achieve that? You stand on this vibration platform, it shakes under your feet at a 43 hertz frequency gets your bones, tendons, muscles, ligaments, all vibrating at the same frequency when you can mold your spine back the way we need to. The science behind it is it stimulates the nerve endings on your feet that send a nerve impulse 300 miles an hour up to the cerebellum. That controls all of your postural muscles. So it does it without you thinking about it. At any point in time, you can control your posture. Sit up for me, everybody sit up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now the moment you stop thinking about that, right, what takes over? Cerebellum's gonna take over. You're gonna default back to your postural state. We're working on bombarding that cerebellum with new neurological input while you're wearing weights to actually teach it to hold your spine in the right position. So long story short, warm up exercises, right? Here's my spine, adjust the spine. When we do the muscle rehab, your muscles will still pull it back. They're just gonna pull it back less severe than before. Then we repeat the process. Warm up exercises, adjust. Muscle memory pulls it back just a little bit less than before. Warm up exercises adjust, muscle memory pulls it back, and every time it pulls it back, it's a little better than it was before, and then eventually the final resting position is a corrected position. Does that make sense? So time and repetition is how we get the correction. We started Jessica. On this process, your visits for these aren't long like today. Today's the longest visit you ever have with me. Most of the time, it's gonna take you about 20 minutes to go through a cycle. 
um, doing all three of those things in the office. So we started Jessica, three visits a week, 90 days. Jessica goes through the process. 90 days later, her low back goes from 35 degrees to 30 degrees. Five degrees of improvement, is she better or worse? Better. Obviously better. Um, what's cool about her is six weeks into care, she comes riding into the front office. She runs into the office and she's like, Dr. Dave, Dr. Dave, you gotta come out. Come outside, come outside, check this out. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And so I run outside, she's got a brand new car. And she's like, thank you so much. It's all because of you that I, I have the new car. And I was legitimately confused. I said, I didn't do anything to, to buy you that new car. She said, no, you don't understand. I've been having migraine headaches for four days a week for the past 16 years. In the past six weeks, I've only had two migraines. I said, holy crap, that's awesome. She's like, so I know my body's healing. We're addressing whatever's going on. I've been getting better, so I decided to stop taking the medication. She was spending 320 bucks a month on, and she took the money and leased a new car. It's like, sweet, awesome, high five, like your body's healing. But because we're not basing it on the symptoms and we hadn't taken the follow-up x-rays yet, I was like, get in there and go get adjusted. So she came in, she kept getting adjusted. We took these x-rays. Um, about a week after, she comes in with a pregnancy test strip from her purse, positive. Her and her husband conceived they had their first child. About a year ago now, 12 months, I met them over at St. Thomas Hospital on a Friday evening. 10.30 p.m., they gave birth to their second little boy, baby Skylar. Um, we met baby Skylar 35 minutes after he was born. We checked his atlas and made sure the birth process, the trauma associated with that didn't misalign his spine. It, it did. We did a light little adjustment. Baby Skylar has been getting adjusted since birth. Best time to start taking care of your spine is when? When you get one, it's like we teach our kids to brush, your, brush their teeth right when they grow in. Why aren't we taking care of our spine? So much more important. And for babies, we don't have to do muscle memory. Um, it's actually just enough pressure equivalent to checking the ripeness of a tomato to adjust the baby. It's pretty cool. And so like, what's that worth to have a family now and be correcting the scoliosis? So this guy was going to another chiropractor for 15 years. This guy's name is Bob. So Bob comes in, Hawaiian shirt, shell necklace, super hyper, um, energies all over the place. And this dude, long story short, he's been getting adjusted for a long period of time. And if I've been getting adjusted for 15 years, what should my spine look like? Great. Absolutely. It should look great. So we took x-rays with him and Bob right here, blue lines are where he's at. The red arc is where he should be. So he's at a 16 degree curve. He should be at 43. Healthy or sick. So he's at a phase one degeneration. So this is a process that's been developing for a while, 12 to 15 years. And the third thing we were looking for was spacing, right? So thick, thick, skinny. Do you guys see how that disc right there is thinner than the other ones? So that skinny disc is nerves that are coming out going right to thyroid. Bob, for the past three years, has been taking hyperthyroid medication. His thyroid levels are through the roof. He's super energetic. He can't wind down at night. He can't go to sleep, so he's an insomniac. He sleeps two and a half hours every night, pops sleeping pills. I'm like, geez, Bob, look, you've had 15 years of nerve pressure and the nerves coming out going to your thyroid. He goes, no, 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 no. I've only had thyroid problems for the past three years. I said, I know it took 12 years of nerve pressure for you to get to 60% where you've been dealing with the symptoms and taking medication for those symptoms for the past three years. Your problem's been there a lot longer than what you think. So we got started with Bob. We started working with him. But before I did, I had to ask, how did you get there in the first place if you've been getting adjusted for 15 years? And he says, well, it isn't what I wanted. It isn't what my doctor wanted. Who has the biggest influence on our health decisions? Insurance company. So he's like, look, I went to a chiropractor that was in network with my doctor. I went 12 visits a year because that's what they covered. So he, he would go one, one day a month, take one step forward when he'd get adjusted. 29 days out of the month, 29 steps backwards, one step forward, 29 backwards. Over the course of 15 years, gravity never took a day off, right? So what happened? Got worse over time. If I wanted to get in the best shape of my life and I set myself on a workout routine where I worked out one day a month, am I ever going to get there? No. I mean, like, when you put it in perspective like that, it's like, duh. But that's what he ended up doing. And it was because the chiropractor he went to was in network with his insurance company, signed a contract. If I sign a contract with your insurance company, whose recommendations do I have to follow? Theirs. 
So here I'm an expert in the field. You're at phase two to generation. You need 60 adjustments over the course of a year. I can't tell you that. I say, look, your insurance covers you for 20 visits, so that's what I'll see you for. I could easily bill insurance all day long and live a happy, healthy life and make money, but that's not what I'm in for. I'm in it for seeing our patients get healthy and giving you the care that you actually need. If we're both guys the same age, right, and we have the same condition and we go to the same primary care doctor, but you have different insurance than I do, do we get the same care? It's like, you might get an MRI, I get a CT scan, for you they catch something, for me they miss it. I'm like, dude, if I got a condition, just give me what I need to get better, right? So that's what I'm gonna do with you guys. We're just gonna give you what does necessary care look like in terms of recommendations. So I did that with Bob. I said, look, Bob, you, you don't need 12 visits, you need 50 visits. Because working with other individuals at phase one with similar presentation as you, that's what it's taken to get the correction we're looking for. He goes, there's no way I can do 50 visits. I've been doing 12. And I said, well, okay, you've been doing 12 visits, right? Because his concern was what? Finances. And everybody's concern is always finances. And I get it. So for Bob, I had to do this breakdown. I was like, Bob, how, how much did you pay per visit when you were getting adjusted? He did a $35 copay, right? So here you go, $35 per visit, multiplied it by 12 visits a year, he's spending 450 bucks. Now, I had to ask though, for you to have the luxury to go see that chiropractor in the first place to be able to pay a $35 copay, how much were you paying for insurance? And I get it, he was using it for other things besides just chiropractic, but he was spending $450 a month on his insurance for the premium so he's spending about $5,400 a year on his premium. And then before insurance would pay out, he had to meet his what? So his deductible was $2,000 deductible. So when you add this all together, Bob was spending about $7,850 for 12 visits of chiropractic care at a chiropractic clinic that was allowing him to get worse over time. I said, Bob, look, you need 50 visits. It is what it is. I wish I could get that lower, and we're working on getting that lower as we get better and better. But the reality is, that's what you need. And he says, okay, if I need 50 visits, can I just kind of pay as I come, pay as I go, type of a thing, like per visit. I was like, yeah, well, sure, you could do that, but it's gonna cost you more money that way. We've designed a monthly payment option and made it way more affordable. Um, but if you did a pay per visit, just like any other medical facility, like if I get adjusted, there's an adjustment fee. If I get x-rays, there's an x-ray fee. It's whatever service I get done that day. So for an average visit, it's about $42 to do the rehab in the back, $30 to do the traction exercise, and then just like anywhere else in town, it's about 60 bucks to get adjusted. So that's the facility fee. You're looking at $132 per visit. $132 per visit, paying per visit for 50 visits, ends up coming out to about $6,600. So he's spending less go than going insurance route, but at least he's getting what? What he actually needs. I said, Bob, instead of doing that, let's go ahead and do the monthly breakdown. Um, and the way that we do the monthly breakdown, there's a certain portion of care that I can't unfortunately discount. And this is because of Medicare guidelines and federal restrictions. So. Whether you have insurance, you don't have insurance, in network, out of network, across the board, I have to play by the insurance ball game for this part of care. Um, for most of us, the lowest number it can be is about 10 visits. I can't reduce the cost of care, it's the same fee. So you're looking at about 1,300 for that portion of care. Then everything beyond that, for the second portion of care, a couple of different things happen. First of all, I wanna give you the ability to take care of your spine at home. So for Bob, we gave him home care equipment and taught him how to do exercises at home so he would stop going home and making the subluxation in the first place. I don't want you to come here three times a week for the rest of your life. I know you have a life to live. So how do we get you to two and to one time a week or once every other week where you're actually holding the adjustment? Well, you're gonna have to do a little bit of work at home. But if I give you the ability to do the exercises at home, then when you come and do them in the clinic, you don't have to pay for them in the clinic. So we're able to get both of those fees out for the remaining number of visits. So for the 40 remaining visits, totaling 50, for all of those visits, you're not paying for the exercises. The second thing that happens is, we've already done a lot of the upfront work. 
if you've gotten momentum going, your spine's moving, I'm no longer under that insurance umbrella. And so basically what happens is for this portion of care, we can set a different fee. So instead of a $60 adjustment fee, we're able to do a $35 maintenance adjustment fee. And so that's the only charge associated with those visits. So you're looking at about 1400 for that portion of care. And then the last piece of the puzzle is just the actual cost of the equipment that we send you home with, the home equipment. So basically looking at about 300 for that, depending on what you need, everybody's a little different. So when you add those three together, instead of 7,850, $6,600, you're looking at about 3,000. Now, less than the cost of braces, the other day I had a patient that came in with Invisalign braces. Just had to ask, I was curious, how much did the Invisalign braces cost? That's kind of high, but $5,600 for them to get Invisalign on their teeth to straighten their teeth. And for three, Bob was able to get his spine corrected. So basically the way we work this is so that's the total. We do a small percentage down payment and then they're e the remainder is equally split over a monthly payment option and there's no interest or financing fees. So Bob was able to get the care he needed for about 220 bucks a month. How awesome is that? Because he goes from 16 to 33 degree curve in his neck. Bob has doubled the curve in his neck. He's almost all the way back. He comes in and throws away his sleeping medication because his thyroid started to turn on, slow down a little bit, and he was actually able to wind down at night and get some sleep. What's that worth? I don't know about you guys, but I love sleep. Like if I get 12 hours of sleep, I'm a happy kid, right? Um, so on the exercise detox side of things, Bob was able to lose 31 pounds as well. This is a video of what happens over the course of my lifetime if there's no intervention. I develop my curve when I'm younger, and then I just go through the course of life and gravity does its work. So this happens for a lot of us, it's inevitable. Chiropractic is not a belief system. I hear people all the time, they're like, I don't believe in chiropractic. I'm like, well, that's great, it, does, it doesn't matter if you believe in it, it's not gonna change the outcome, right? Because it's a law, science is a law, there's a thing called gravity, and if I drop the pen, what happens? Yeah, because gravity's gravity, right? So it's an immutable law, I can't change it. So I can be like, I don't believe in gravity, but every time I drop the pen, it falls. So what does happen though, is if I understand a law, then I can leverage, I can intervene and leverage that law to my advantage. So if I understand gravity pulls down, I can drop the pen, but now I can intervene and take the appropriate action to bring it back. So the same thing happens here. This is a video of what happens to your spine over time. Time-lapse video. Nope, there it goes. So gravity pulls your head forward, starts pushing the bones in the neck backwards. This is about eight years, 10 years, 12 years. You're gonna notice decreased spacing, atlas bone landing, it's curving in the wrong direction. My body, because it's a poor structure, is gonna to start to reshape the bones to try and stabilize it and stop any further nerve damage. And it continues to develop over the course of my lifetime. It's inevitable, it's just how it happens. So whether I believe it or not, this process is happening to every single one of us because of how gravity weighs down on our spine. So the thing is, if I catch it, and I catch it early enough right here, it's much easier to get back to where I need to be. But if I catch it here and then I choose not to do anything about it, hey man, it is what it is, everybody makes their own decisions, but if I let it continue to develop, it keeps getting worse. So if I let it go to down here, then it costs more time and more money to fix the problem because it's a more complex problem. Do you guys get what I'm saying? So when I took your x-rays, we said, boom, ch -ch, snapshot in time, ch -ch, snapshot in time. This is where you're at. This is where you're at. This is where you're at. And we have two options. We can do something about it. We can start moving it back in the right direction and rehab the spine, or we can choose to, maybe now is not the best time for you. But um, when it comes down to it, hopefully most people choose the right option because right here, when we put up your x-rays, we're gonna, in the back room, either Dr. John or myself is gonna be going through your films with you guys. Um, we're gonna ask you a couple different questions. Based on what you guys know now, um, what do you see taking place with your spine? So for, for instance, do you see the curve? Do you have the curve in the spine or is your spine devoid of the curve? Right here you'll see a number, down here is where it's supposed to be. So negative five out of 43. The second thing we're gonna be asking you is, 
Well, if it's not where it's lined up properly, how's that causing some of the problems you're dealing with? So you look and see where some of the nerves are, and we'll help you guys with that, connecting some of the dots. And then the third question, and the most important question I could ask you is, is this something that you're committed to getting corrected? If it is, awesome. We'll go ahead and go through recommendations with you guys. We'll show you what is it going to take to get there. We'll make sure you're on the same page with it. Um, and then I believe it's either Max or Sarah will be going through uh, finances with you guys so that Dr. John and I can go through everybody's x-rays. Um, you guys have already been here for a little while tonight, so when we get through that process, if you want to hang out afterwards, I can get you adjusted. If not, I totally understand. We can do that on your next visit. I just want to let you guys know that I'm here for you guys tonight. Um, so if it takes me until 9 o'clock, it takes me until 9 o'clock, but I'll be here to get you guys adjusted afterwards. Um, Three things I want to remind you guys of, or I should say ask you because you don't know already. Number one, for you guys to be a patient in my clinic, I'm just going to ask that you do these three things. Number one, put the time and energy and necessary buckle down a little bit to get your spine corrected. Basically what I mean is follow the recommendations. In a relationship, if the expectations are clear from the beginning, it's a good relationship, right? So if I say, hey, look, I expect this from you as a patient, this is how you're going to get the results, and then... You say, okay, doc, I expect for you to come up or come in and uh, show up at 150% every single time and deliver the best possible adjustment. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, when I was younger, I finally went to a chiropractor when I was 18. And my entire life, I'd been dealing with the asthma and the allergies and taking the medications. And I'd longed in my soul to figure out, well, what the heck is going on? Like, what's causing it? Because I knew I wasn't born with it. Finally, I go to a chiropractor. He takes x-rays on the top part of my back and finds damage on the nerves going right to my lungs, damage on the nerves going right to my lymphatic system, which was affecting my body's histamine response. And I had been taking antihistamines for allergies for years. So for me, it was the first time I ever had a doctor sit down with me and tell me, this is what's causing your problem, not here, take this new script. So for me, it was a day of liberation because I was like, holy crap, here it is, that's what's causing my problem. I was one of five kids, two older brothers, two younger sisters. Parents couldn't afford care, so I had to figure out a way to make it happen. I had to figure out a way of getting the resources, so I applied to a bunch of different jobs. Got a job lining baseball fields with the chalk diamonds um, and putting lines on soccer fields for the township, and I got paid a contract check. Took the contract check, put it in the bank, went, paid for my chiropractic care. I got a discount off of care. Um, and then I went shopping at the mall afterwards, but I followed all the recommendations the doctor gave me, and within three months of care, Literally, I came off of every medication that I had ever taken. Since I've been 18, I've been living this lifestyle, allowing the body to express health from the inside out, and it's been my sole mission to reach as many people as we can to teach them some of this information so that we can see the same liberation happen for others. Um, so if you follow the recommendations, I promise you'll see results. When you commit, God always honors commitment. The second thing is within two weeks of starting care, mom, brother, twice removed second cousin, I don't care if it's family, we want to help you guys get your family checked. That doesn't mean they have to start care, it's for your peace of mind so you know where they stand, we'll run a scan, take x-rays on them at no cost. Number three, tell other people that you know and be on mission with us. So here you go, Nashville, there's a, what, one million people in Nashville area. There's no way physically I'm going to be able to adjust every single one of those people, that's not what it's about. I'm never going to hesitate to ask you guys, though, who do you know, who do you love, who do you care about that needs to live a healthier life? Because it's our mission to reach them and get them this information. I know it's the information that could make a difference. If I were to rewind 35 years ago, put my mom in one of these seats and teach her this information, it could have radically transformed how she viewed and managed her health. So it's not about this office and growing this office. We have maximized living clinics that are all around Nashville. Um, we also have maximized living clinics that are all around the nation. So if you have family in Colorado or California, let me know. I'll try and find them a doctor close to them. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and bring you guys back in the order that you arrived. Um, we're going to ask you those questions with your x-rays. Dr. John and I will be going through recommendations, and then we'll go ahead and go through uh, finance options for you guys and what does insurance cover, not cover. Cool? All right. You guys can feel free to get up, move around, drink some water. <clears throat> Okay, let me go put this.